to Sense Space. I'm here today with Gary Shang of America 2.0. It's going to be our third conversation on Sense Space, I believe. We've been talking uh, periodically, and I'm really happy to have him on today to do a little bit of a, a year in review and a deep dive into some of the deeper currents that we are both sensing into and and feel are important to explore at this time. So great to have you back, Gary Shang. Thanks, Jacob. It's great to see you. Excited to like meander around on a few topics. That is, that's what we do here. So what is your year in review feeling like? It's a great question. The last 12 months have been, I guess, the over the overarching theme of my life has increasingly been how can I achieve creative freedom and not be uh, doing things that I'm only really doing because I need to pay the bills. <clears throat> um, arguably, I have been on that path for many years, but I think I've just become more conscious of that goal. Also, like I think maybe in earlier years, I kind of adopted the the mission statement of uh, like the Civics Unplugged, which I co-founded, which is like my life mm. became a lot about democracy. And that's that's an important thing. Um, but I'm a lot less shy about saying about myself and other people that they that you know you need to flourish yourself like you yourself must flourish and be sovereign in order to help other people flourish and be sovereign mm. uh, i definitely did not feel as creatively free as i do now um it's been a year since i departed from civics unplugged and um i just feel like i'm thinking a lot more clearly um i am a better writer than i used to be i think i i understand myself a lot better i also like have been chiseling myself right you know like yeah it's one thing it's it's both discovering yourself and then building yourself and what what you what people often find themselves in is environments where they feel really pressured to be something based on who's giving them money and uh, just what the norm is. And me having traveled to, to like South, briefly in South America and then to Chicago for six months and then a Montenegro for two months, which was crazy. It was a lot to talk about there. And uh, currently visiting my parents in Vegas. And I'm going to also be doing travels in Africa for the first time. And then what's after that, who knows? But mm. um, I've there's a lot, there's a lot to say. I think I've discovered that what feels most authentic to me is that I am someone that wants to make a positive contribution, supporting human flourishing and sovereignty around the world. How exactly I do that is kind of a, a pretty big open question. And I've, I've never felt more okay with that being an open question. I think I, I think in earlier years of my life, I felt a lot of pressure to pick a mission and almost like with democracy reform, I felt this pressure for it to be like the, the most powerful leverage point. It's like, Oh, this is the silver bullet. Right. And I think what's given me a lot of clarity that that is not the silver bullet and mm -hmm. that there is no silver bullet um, is 
seeing Andrew Yang go all in on democracy reform or like put so much of his brand equity towards that and also just realizing like energetically it's not very strong right that's not where like people are not I don't know what it would take maybe maybe someone's capable of making ring choice voting sexy and but even if it like I think part of why it's not that sexy is because I think people intuitively understand that our why like America feels sick runs way deeper than our current political systems. Yeah. The political systems don't help. They definitely produce polarizing candidates, but um, my optimistic take, and we can get into, we can spend a lot of time talking about RFK, but my optimistic take is that we just needed to go through like extremes to it's like let's try this out like let's try this out let's like let's feel it out and then like okay wait this combination of characteristics is what 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 feels right mm. um and maybe that's our okay maybe it's not but uh that's certainly what feels like it's happening at, at a more macro level that that would have happened with it, regardless of whether there was 10% more ranked choice voting in the country uh, or not. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave room for like follow-ups because I can go in many different directions with this. But yeah, the last year, I think I've gotten to know myself a lot better. I've uh, met tons of people, which also helps you understand who you are because you get to see what they're good at and like how like everyone I think wants to make a unique contribution and and so it's like okay what am I good at what do, what do I like doing um and what what can I get paid for and that's I'm always trying to find that triangulation and just being around a lot of really brilliant people over the last year um doing all kinds of things has this has, has uh is kind of like it's in, in a way it feels like I've taken a step back because um, you give like in my old paradigm where I'm like, you have to pick a mission and just stick yeah. to it for, for forever. But I, in, in actuality, I feel like I've taken a lot of steps forward because um, and just like listening more to like my heart about like what feels right to do and right now it is a mix of things and there's if i were to say that there's common threads yes it's like human flourishing and sovereignty um and hmm. part of why it is valuable for me to be in multiple kind of like in the mix of multiple geographies and industries is that i can i can cross pollinate good ideas from different ones and Those silos are a real thing. Yeah, for sure. I think um, first and foremost, what I kind of, I recognize that quality as both as an aspect of our politics and also of like American culture, which is this emphasis on like having the vision, having like the... Um, penetrative vision that you're at you have absolute conviction of and you're just gonna force it into the world and then that's gonna be the way that you you know uh affect change and also leverage your elevation in the world at the same time um and so that's really like a deep kind of paradigmatic assumption that a lot of people are uh experiencing the breakdown of and i think one of the big themes of covid and late covid um was this shifting off of an, a whole host of people into more of a embrace and contending with uncertainty um which you could mm. also frame as holding holding like open question marks um rather than having concrete answers um 
And this seems to connect a lot with what you've spoken to in terms of taking more of a polymath kind of approach. Um, there is this like new way of participating, um, which, you know, just like that focus on a uniformity of vision, we've also been encouraged to specialize in like one kind of pillar of things. And there's another way of being available to us. And that um, seems to be emerging in this time, which is much more, you know, like branches of a tree or something like that. And your uh, value and contribution is the emergent sum of being connected with all of those different parts. Um, but as a consequence, it's not so easy to simply, uh, you know, there, there's an advantage to being a single issue guy, you know, I you just been in so yeah. many spaces. If I was just focused on trauma or just focused on dialogue or just focused on conscious cannabis or just focused on whatever, and I made that my thing, then of course, eventually you start getting um more traction whereas if you're trying to do all those things and occupy the space in between um it can be a little bit uh off radar but it is generating something really valuable and there's there's qualities in that in between space um and it's it there's probably a degree of courage required to occupy it as well because like the conversational demand and i'm sure you face this is like oh what are you doing <laughs> What are you doing for work? Or, you know, what are you about? And then the demand to like have that prepared response. Uh, you know, you have that, as you were saying about sovereignty and so on. I have a similar line with my work that I kind of feel like the three main themes are about insight, wisdom, and healing. But if I'm just to go around and st- if I'm, if I just answer every question like that, then I'm basically doing a pitch. I'm not in genuine organic participation with what wants to happen in this particular situation, you know, with like this random person, how does life want to happen here? How does life want to happen here? Um, and that's a very different model of change. So, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll put those pieces out. Um, I'm also very interested mm-hmm. to talk more about RFK because I've been deeply struck by him. And I'm also stepping into that same kind of nomadic posture that you've been in. And I think there's a lot to, to consider about that as a kind of life practice as well. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I'm sticking some notes on the side and I mean, let me just go down a few reactions. So you, you mentioned that it takes a lot of courage really to be in this in, in between space. And yeah, I didn't, I know this really well. I mean, what, one of the reasons why it takes courage is, you know, your, your parents are like, what are you doing? Right. Cause it's the opposite of, of what was success for them, which was p- truly picking a lane and just doing that for decades. <clears throat> um, but, and, and I think neither of us are saying that it's, it's, the lanes aren't helpful i think most people need to pick lanes most like i don't want my barber to also be a philosopher uh if it's if it's affecting his or her ability to be like good at cutting hair um i don't want my you know uh if if i if i need to hire a cleaning service i don't really need to care that they have all the i don't really need to know about all their different side projects but um, so if you're hired for a job you you know, you should, you should be good at it, regardless of if you do other stuff. But um, if your um, job is to be, have you, have you seen this documentary called The Black Godfather? No. I, I put it on, on your list because it may give you personal inspiration, uh, like it has given for me. So there's this super multi-hyphenate creator, entrepreneur, investor, blah, blah, blah. Guy named Clarence Avon. I don't know if he's still alive. He's probably, if he is, he's super old. But like Obama, Kamala, like all the top, you know, all the rappers give him credit. Like all the OG rappers give him credit for being like mentors to Like he, like he, he was involved in everything that he felt was meaningful. And the, the common thread was 
uh, like black advancement, even though he wouldn't, he would not pigeonhole himself as like a civil rights guy. Like he just like wanted to have the backs of people that look like him. And so he, he helped negotiate movie deals, album, uh, yeah, like record deals, like, you know, help do, do fundraisers for Obama, you know, et cetera. And that's like precisely where I'm at where, and, and, but it's not, this is the interesting thing, Jacob, like, it's not as simple as saying there's just systemic or as systemic of racism as there was, as there, as there was in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. It's a different, is a different tribe that needs a Clarence Avon or multiple Clarence Avons. And it's not even limited to America anymore. And that's something that's been interesting for me as someone that created a, a blog called America 2.0. Like, because in part of why I, I did that and pe pe people are like, why are you limiting yourself to America? I'm like, well, you know, the world is full of these like globalists. They just focus on the world and they have no, you know, they're not grounded in reality. They have no geographic focus. And maybe we can get into that on a separate point, but um, the tribe is clearly not just people that were born in the US, right? And it's not just like black people or Asian people or white people. Like there's like, there's a common thread across you and me that that is that does need to be articulated. And maybe I can challenge you to articulate that. Um, but there needs to be movies made, music made, um, mm -hmm. uh, like festivals made. And these are, you know, and, and businesses made, et cetera, for like a very conscious, like non-greenwashy, like, you know, regenerative um, movement that doesn't, that doesn't like fit neatly within like a particular sector or geography. Um, of course, any number of people in this broader global scene should be able to to focus on their particular geography. But like, um, I find myself in this really interesting, self challenging, and but awesome position where I am in the rooms uh, of top tech leaders like Vitalik. Like, I got breakfast with him many times in in montenegro um and then like top ai people and you know uh like the hottest new artists um and, and like you know i don't know if you've seen christ spiracy or sea spiracy or what the health or like one of these like one of those big food documentaries but like i'm mm -hmm. friends with those people now right that have their documentaries have been seen by billions of people <clears throat> And so like, it all, it's funny because like, I'm feeling excited even just explaining the kind of situation I'm in, but it's like, that doesn't change the fact that it requires a lot of courage um, to just be okay with your parents not understanding what you're doing and kind of almost like subtly not approving of it or explicitly not approving of this path that is that is quite risk on, even like according to them, even if uh, I, I bet you and I would argue every job is risky now. There's no, there's no, there's like not much stability in any path that you could pick. So why not pick a path that resonates with your soul, right? If the, you know, if you, you know, like, just a decade ago or or i don't know earlier years you'd have people that are like yeah google's the most stable job you know uh, bank of america very stable job and it's like you're having you're seeing big banks collapse like every month now and then you're seeing google etc laying off tens of thousands of people at a time so what's actually stable and then mm -hmm. like what you had to do to get those jobs is to completely sacrifice your sovereignty. Because if you ask anyone that 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 uh that joins one of these jobs, if they have free speech, 
if they if they can act if they uh if they can do whatever they think the a free person could could do that's like legal and not bad like they they anyone that's honest would say there's a very constrained number of things that they could be doing and that a lot of people are not as sensitive as i am to that but uh it it really sucked i felt suffocated which is why i had to leave um yeah i think that's a it's a, it's a good little riff on, on the courage part um and and we'll pause for any reactions or we can go to a different topic mm. As the first thing that comes to me is uh, resonating with the importance of the, like, I don't know if this is like more coming up for you now because you're like visiting home and so on, but like the the return home is a theme that I've lived out and I went back home for six months uh, mm. last year and like that, that feels so important to Like in some way, what binds us together is holding vision for a future that doesn't yet exist. Mm. And also taking an orientation, which is significantly informed by the feminine and not just the masculine. Mm. So it's being guided by intuition. It's being guided by soul and synchronicity. Um and when it's really flowing, it's something like a, a flowing through. Like when you're in that genuine creative process, it doesn't feel like you're the one that's hmm. engineering it. And that kind of scales out. Like we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily constrained by the feeling that we need to control and engineer the emergence of the new thing and yet we paradoxically hold that with the reality that we you know it rests on us and our choice making and sovereignty and so on <laughs> i is, love that wow that's we... that's really well said dang that's great yes it's like i but, think but the last piece the last piece is just like then you you bring that right back home and you come back to the roots and you you come back to being with family and being with friends and all those places and this there's a real dimension of um emotional work and like yeah it's just very significant it's been a very significant piece for me to you know as part of this going nomadic spending time with different friends and family and that's where you come into contact with all of the bubbles and all of the fields oh yeah that make up our collective reality and it's your yeah. you know you have to to process that in such a way that you can come into full contact with it um work through the the energies that come out of that and still come back to that place of connectedness with with the deepest vision Hundred percent. Oh, I think being starting to be a bit nomadic has given me tons of self awareness about like where I'm at and also just how I'm growing. And like even just from I visited my parents for most of January, and it's only been less than six months, and I changed a lot in just in just that amount of time um it's like it's like a it's like a humbling like experience it's 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 so important to come back to your roots because even if you have some kind of cultural friction between you and your parents like if you cannot resolve that if you cannot um live with acceptance of difference as well uh, you have no skill set to do that at any wider scale i think it's 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 a, it's a really beautiful thing um this is also why i uh 
I'm very suspicious of people that claim to want to change the world and their whole personal lives are a mess, right? And I think like almost like people that want to father the world and they're shitty fathers. I'm not going to name names, but like there's very <laughs> prominent people that are very, very negligent fathers. And I'm like, it's like you have a track record of fathering great companies and et cetera. But it's like, how much trust should we give? How much responsibility should we give you? Given that you have children that are resentful to you for being neg neg negligent. It's almost like one of the most, it's like if you're opting into this role, like the sacred role uh, and you do a shitty job. Um, it's like, why should we listen to your the rest of your recommendations for the future of civilization? And I feel that does kind of touches on a little bit the like soul of the nation theme which actually a number of people mentioned to me when they heard I was coming on this trip to the US. They're like, you know, please, you know, my home country needs help. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, not necessarily just the US, as you say, but um, how to put it is that we have like paradigmatic assumptions that what's going on in media and what's going on in politics is the most important thing. And then when we connect with what's most important, that doesn't necessarily match. Um, and so those kind of hidden out of, out of the limelight um, works, deeds, uh, you know, energetic work, all of that stuff is fundamentally and equally important uh and and not at all separable from the big the big show the big campaign the big like world changing um effort and so that's um that's the assumption that i'm i'm now trying to work within um and i think with that also there is also a demand Like if we, in some sense, it's a spiritual uh, issue in America. Like it's certainly deeper than politics. It's certainly a cultural level, but we could say it's the soul of the country uh, in some way. It's like it, it's in the psyche, uh, like psychic fragmentation, and it's at that kind of level. Um, so in order to engage in that work most meaningfully, we have to be kind of following our own souls yeah. uh, calling. And that also involves the sovereignty of a life that enables you to listen to it. Because if you're getting all different little micro addictions or micro boundary crossings or micro things coming in, it fogs up your capacity to hear that. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I actually feel like the what i'll broadly call energetic work has become a large portion of my purpose and participation and it's literally because i'm sensing so much i'm taking in so much to be able to go away and metabolize that and then come back again and come back again and come back again and be well coupled with wherever i am um and and then beyond that who knows, but that's kind of the, the being in touch with those roots of struggle, let's say, and being in touch with life as it's actually happening is the kind of core nutrients that then create that artwork and create that music. And I started making rap uh, for the last <laughs> nice. four or five months. So I'm definitely <laughs> feeling, um, feeling like those kinds of, um, expression forms are going to give potency to this emergence dope it's great to hear yeah <laughs> yeah we can go a lot of ways with this um so you touched on the soul
when I think of soul, like like a like a pure soul, I think of authenticity. I think of um, how I have definitely at various moments I've not gone fully over it. Just like, I don't think anyone has uh, audience capture. So my so I actually paused my Substack for a number of reasons. Um, well, the main one is just because I wanted to focus on building stuff, but the other one was. I wanted to publish without worrying about what the audience, um, whether I was serving the audience. And this actually goes back to what we were talking about with like specialty. Like if you become like, I also want to talk about Andrew Tate. <laughs> uh, but if you become like the trauma guy, everything's about trauma, right? Yeah. Uh, you have a hammer, everything. If you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I just, I just found myself make sense making about things like I, I was like for a while I was like doing an okay job tying together what I wanted to talk about with America 2.0, but I just felt like no, I just, I just need to like sense make without worrying about whether like with my only with my only concern is whether it's authentic to what I'm actually seeing and sensing into. And so it's like sense making nuggets. I just wanted to, I want to just publish sense making nuggets. Hmm. And I was like, where do I do this? And I don't, it's like, I didn't have a, a location for this. And so I created wiki.garyshang.com where now there's like, in just like the last like two, three weeks, how, how long? Yeah. Just not, not long ago. I published like dozens of like these sense making artifacts that do not have to, I mean, again, I could make up a reason why it ties to America 2.0, uh, but it's just whatever I, I want to make sense of whatever I find meaningful. And I've, uh, you know, uh, where, how does this fit into the bigger picture? Well, Unless you are, even as an individual where I'm the editor in chief and the writer, one person show with America 2.0, I still felt, and, and I was not actually trying to grow fast. So there was like the least amount of audience capture of like a, any typical sort of media endeavor. It's like very low on that totem pole of concern because I was not optimizing for quick growth. Like I was not creating an AI newsletter where like I'm going to be trapped as soon as we can only talk about AI. I, I was able to talk about a, a wide variety of things, but yet I still felt like this self-censorship nature where I'm like, okay, I want to talk about this, but I can't because not not really what my audience is expecting. And so imagine this, like when there's even just two people in a publication and like you have New York Times, right? And you have all these, like how much capture there is. So how well can they actually sense into the rapidly changing uh, world? And so I just felt almost yeah. all of the media that we consume is... I'm definitely like not, I did, I don't, I don't want to say I invented something new, but like, I don't know anyone else that's just like publishing sense making artifacts with no expectation of readership at all. And like, I feel so good because I feel like I'm more in touch with my, my truth of what I'm experiencing. And it's giving me more grounded self groundedness to be like, what is actually most meaningful uh, to do? <clears throat> Um, part of why I think RFK is just feels interesting to me is he just it's not a you can put aside like whether his policies are good or bad that he's proposing. Like he feel it really feels like he's operating based on what he feels like is true and what is meaningful to 
to talk about and bring to people's consciousness. And he's like not captured. And we could be very wrong about that, right? Um, but that's part of why I feel so re refreshing and just like this individual that's like grappling with the moment and you know his his but his particular choice was to run for pre the president uh, which is something that almost no one can replicate but everyone can think about like okay who am i what am i good at what am i passionate about what could i what could sustain me and it's like then they could lean into that and i feel like that's like what i'm, I'm trying to figure that out uh and while I definitely am part of me is scared, another part of me is very fulfilled because I'm trying to, I'm like, I'm matching my actions with what my soul feels is uh, the right thing to do. And I just, I, I can't, I, like, I, I had, maybe I'm stupid, but I had like some, I still think it's possible that DeSantis is better than Trump, for example. But like, it's just a whole different genre of politician that RFK is. Like DeSantis does, feels like he's he's a very talented at, I don't mean this in a negative, necessarily negative way. He's an opportunist <laughs> where he identifies a cultural issue and he picks a side and he goes really hard on that issue. But RFK is like, just feels like someone that's been trying to make sense of what is the, the right thing to do in this very complicated time when truth is being weaponized and um, there's so much corporate capture, et cetera. And that's also what I'm trying to figure out to do. It's like, oh, it's like, wow, like it's, it's cool to see someone on such a high level do that. Um, and sorry to, to be rambling, but the, the other thing I want to plant the seed of, and we can really dive into dialogue about RFK and just any of these topics, you're like he's not a perfect guy at all. He, he had mm -hmm. a, I don't know if this is not, I don't know if this is true or not, but he had a diary where he wrote down all the different mistresses he had. Do you know that? No. And uh, arguably, his infidelity led to his ex, well, his, yeah, his ex-wife's suicide. So there's like so much symbolism here. And I, and, I, and I don't doubt that he's, it's none of my business to like ask him this such a personal thing. But I'm sure he's, he has grappled with that a lot about the consequences of those actions. And so, look, none of us are are perfect. All of the candidates that are like prominent today have major, major things that they've done wrong in their lives. Um, I almost wonder if culturally we're growing up to realize that humans are humans, and I don't know what what is what 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 do we need to look for in our candidates. Um, whatever mm. soul is, whatever, it's like what, people that are moved by their soul, people that feel like they're actually capable of growth. I don't know, some combination of these things. I think those two would be fucking huge. Not at all insignificant to have candidates for whom the notion of self-development at all was important and for whom soul was important would be the biggest paradigm shift we've seen in a long, 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 long time. That's true. Thank you for, thank you for, I guess, validating that. I think we're just, and I'll just plant one more seed for you and then love mm. for you to just riff here. I just feel like we have, we have such a, a culture of prostitution. And I mean that both with like literal prostitution and also just worshiping money so much that you'll do whatever, whatever for money. Not everything is just reverse engineering for money, right? You'll you'll speak the language of virtue for the money and the power. Right? It's 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 just so, such a embedded characteristic of America that we don't even think about it. 
and that that when people explain why they're doing using the language of virtue like we it doesn't it doesn't like stand out because there's so few authentic people that you don't really see inauthenticity and possibly and, and like this culture of being a whore for money um but that's absolutely what american culture is but, but i do think that there there's is going to be an inflection point if we're not already in the beginning stages of it because i think we've maxed it out we really like we we went from it being kind of like yes you're encouraging your kids to to get the highest paying job to now like oh no actually just be a prostitute be a digital one and it's way way more efficient actually and you can actually be a pro like a, a typical prostitute like oh oh fly me out for 100k like i'll do that like do we understand that that's what we normalized that we like like i don't i don't care if you call me like conservative prude for calling this out that's not a culture i want to live in there has to be more than that hmm. there's definitely been a generational shift occurring where Jordan Hall talks about this, like the shift in the business world from doing what is doing what is right and then doing whatever you can to get ahead and a shift from one to the other, like in each mm. generation where in one instance it was kind of like do what's right. And then, you know, the, the monetary focus was a small mm. subset of that. And then that part has grown and grown and the do what's right part has shrunk and shrunk. Um, and that yes. is a pollutant on the commons and it's a pollutant on um, the entire information ecology and various institutions. Um, and so, yeah, I do feel like potentially we're reaching an end point of that. And, you know, when I saw RFK, the first engagement I had with him with his book on Anthony Fauci during COVID, which was intense, uh, pretty mind-blowing expose. Um, and then I didn't hear much about him. And then about four or five months ago, maybe more, he popped up. And I had a really clear knowing that he was the guy. I just felt it. Like I felt a certainty that he was the one that could steer the ship in a different direction and that he, he would achieve that. It was this weird correspondence of like, I know he's the one. And I also believe it's going to happen. Um, and then at the same time, a feeling of like, you know, what can I do to bring that about? But I think there's a compounding interest available to us when we deviate from serving the idol of money. Um, and as you say, that's not just tied up with money. It's tied up with expectations cultural expectations um familial expectations like there are these iterative micro choices that we make toward what's true what feels right that compound and a lot of people are playing a game which is kind of like i'm gonna get my money first and then i'm gonna get my values right but if you play that long enough you lose the values and you might even lose the money too because we're heading into a future that's really uh so radically different from the, the present moment we're in um and that's that's the true that for me is the true reality that i experience when i tune in with myself and when i tune into other people in the field it's listening to charles eisenstein and aubrey marcus this morning um talking also about rfk and yeah and various I, started, I started listening to that it was good yeah when i tuned into that i could feel like ah you know not only this isn't just a podcast this transmission is 
causing me to feel like I'm remembering myself. I'm connecting back with with something that feels more true. Um, yeah, and with that, there is a radical shift in the in the horizon of what's possible. Uh, I often talk with my friend Matthew Green, who used to be a journalist at Reuters, uh, and he kind of like you with Google, perhaps broke away from that environment and is now kind of soloing his own thing with a smaller NGO and doing his sub stack. And he really could feel the funnel inside of Reuters about what could be said, what couldn't be said. And I think what I'm recognizing through all these conversations with him is that these funnels are existing across the board. Um, you could also call it like an ontological frame. You know, it's it's connected with not just what's possible to think, but how it's possible to be. Um, and yeah, so that is deeply related. That's the invisible box um, that we are in. And certainly the money idolatry makes it hard to, it, it makes the the enframement that we are in less and less easy to recognize. It's more and more kind of invisibly enveloping us. And so what seems to be happening in the world is that the 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 continuation of the funneling of the frame along with the kind of civilizational acceleration is reaching some sort of breaking point in relation to the true complexity and mysteriousness of the reality that we live in. And that cracks are starting to show here and here and here and here and here. And then there's kind of like anxiety and uncertainty with that. People who are playing the money game, which in some ways is also rooted in need for security, actually face a choice to like drawing closer, close their nervous systems down more, double down into the game and be like, all right, shit's that they have a sense like shit's in the fan, but I'm going to double down and I'm going to get mine kind of thing. And then there's another move, which is to actually kind of open your heart and emotionally accept uh, what is. And that could be the fear of the uncertainty. And it could also just be the, the reality of what's going on in the American soul as you're directly connected to it. But in making that opening, create a space of possibility and the ontological frame becomes open or at least it becomes softened it becomes permeable they become more question marks around the edge and that really reshapes uh, what conversation can be what dialogue can be and what reality can be um, and we can get into what you know what those things are but for me things like the metaphysical reality of Christ as I've began to experience it over the past year um, is kind of an inexplicable piece that I've been integrating. Christ. And none of this Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Oh, I thought you said um, Christ. Yeah. Christ. Yeah. 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 And alongside that, you know, this seemingly uh, emergent reality of UFOs, whatever ufos points to um something that i'm sincerely seeking to integrate also into my ontological frame of what's possible what's going on where we really are um and i think that's what makes listening to charles and aubrey such a distinct experience because both of them are on a soul journey and they've let go of so many layers of ontological framing and opened up to the mysterious sense that there's something greater going on here um, and that we can participate in that. So the last thing I just wanted to add is, you know, you wrote that piece which was the one that led me to reach out to this conversation. I can't remember the exact title, but it was, it was something like why I might, you know, why I might need to leave America to serve America 2.0. Uh, 
And so that to me was like an example of uh, when we fully kind of embrace the contradictions of the frames that we're in, you like kind of break beyond it. Uh, and it's kind of connected with that idea of status burning and, you know, like the Gary Sheng that exists as an avatar and then the Gary Sheng of Gary Sheng's soul realization can come into conflict. And then you, you, you're going to face choices between, um, the avatar and where the real Gary Sheng wants to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and then there's risk. All right. Slight little, uh, microphone interruption there, but we'll pick it up, uh, on the edge of that series of threads that I just laid out, I think around mm. ontological opening and breaking out of funnels and, and how we kind of individually gather the courage to do that and how consequential that can be as a form of leadership. It's so interesting um, how brilliantly the forces of spiritual censorship have have engineered things or things organically happen or it's a mix of the both where uh it felt well, that actually required courage which I, i'm not like proud that i i felt like i needed to require courage to just say hey i don't know if you saw like i the, the thread that it was like, why you should not feel crazy to take RFK seriously. It was not an endorsement uh, piece. It was just like, hey, we've gotten many things wrong in the past. Uh, RFK is pointing out some, some things that should be obvious if you're not just trying to gaslight people like Fauci it does all the time. Like we've been just mass gaslighted. And I'm not saying that everything he's, that RFK said is accurate. But, but we've been lied to about so many of the biggest things where when, so, when someone comes to the scene who's so refreshingly honest about the biggest things and, <clears throat> well, you should not feel crazy for getting, for paying attention <laughs> and maybe get, even getting excited. Um, I don't know, like, how does it even happen where almost w w without having to like explicitly coordinate, they're just like this, like a, a system of like, that erects these like prison boundaries of what you're able to say and not say get erected and like <clears throat> someone be said, oh you're you're technically out to say whatever it's like not without consequence even if you're saying something completely like reasonable that's that's the brilliance of the culture that that they had created it's 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 decaying quickly right now like in the next year it's just going to be like not very powerful at all <clears throat> and i don't know what elon's intentions were uh about buying twitter and it's like i can see at multiple angles of why you should be alarmed or not that alarmed that he's all these different limitations on twitter but him buying twitter completely changed what is acceptable to talk about and rfk pointed that out i was like, I know, like why is he that why is he like explicitly thanking Elon for having bought Twitter and how it's like a, it was a historical moment? Well, that's what I felt when he bought Twitter. I made a video explaining why I think Twitter is the big idea acceleration machine. And when you have basically the Biden administration or the Obama, the ongoing Obama administration deciding what is allowed to be said or not, but they don't really understand how all the negative consequences of that. Like, I I posted that thread just saying you're you're not crazy to to take RFK seriously, and I immediately got like a bunch of people that were basically saying um, the worst things about RFK, and also like and saying like 
uh, basically insinuating that it was very dangerous for me to say what I said. Is that like the killing, you're killing grandma kind of danger? Yes, it's like you you do not like you know you don't you do not know what uh, you know. Basically, there's the the idea is that oh we we must protect people from certain ideas, uh, or um, or it's like oh this person is so wrong it's gonna kill it it's gonna kill us all. And that line of thinking that ideas, especially ideas that might be true, could be dangerous to our health is just such a horrible premise. It's so dangerous because it, is, it becomes so easily weaponized, uh, which we've just seen again and again and again over the last few years. Uh, it's, it's against your own safety to even discuss certain things, to open that Pandora's box, like the government must, or the social media companies that we have basically employed under our surveillance and censorship operations, they must be the ones in charge of deciding uh, what is uh, in even in bounds to to discuss. It's very dangerous, uh, and it's not doesn't even it doesn't even work to deal with like violent extremists because it creates it right. It, it it creates people that feel like they need to do radical things because they feel like 1984 has already come right in a lot of in a lot of ways already has so um of all the different kind of scenarios of how the last year could have played out with the free the fight for free speech like i feel like it's been going pretty great actually i'm like actually very pleasantly surprised um there's tons of like decentralized social media platforms that are like actually just through math, uh, just censorship resistance, r resistant. So the the overall incentive landscape to be overly censorious is declining because um, now free speech is just it just which is more available everywhere. So you're not you cannot be blank like just before there were just fewer social media platforms. And and so it was easier to blame the the existing social media platforms um, for misinformation, blah blah blah. But it's like now there's so many platforms where you just it doesn't make sense to blame Elon for everything that anyone thinks, right? And so it's a, a lot of things have changed. I think for the better, uh, in a, in a, honestly a quite surprising way. I'll pause there. I mean, you mentioned Christ, and that's a whole like can of worms. That I mean, there's tons we can talk about. Yeah, I think that observation is really helpful. That the diversification of the landscape of social media makes it less appealing or effective to try and lay down this orthodoxy and impose it you can't anymore i guess the simple the simple way to put it is you can't control the fully control the narrative anymore before you kind of could you all you yeah. could do is get twitter or facebook on board and then youtube right and they did for a while and now like there's tons of competitors and in fact the more that a platform gets censored the more a platform that's like oh rumble got censored so we're gonna do another rumble that's like actually uncensored right so it just it's it's becoming unmanageable for the government to have all these tentacles in every in every company now and i think that's that's a super underrated benefit of like this decentralization of social media it's, it's kind of like annoying that you have to, like for a lot of people it's like oh now I have to check more platforms but for the greater good i think it's a huge plus and RFK's candidacy more or less represents the total subversion of that censorious paradigm because he's been 100% subject to that and in some ways stands as the representative of, you know, thousands of others and doctors and physicians and all kinds of um, 
people who've had the courage to stand against that orthodoxy, you know, and it's not even about a particular orthodoxy because the goalposts keep moving. Um, but I think underlying that is also a hubris. Um, like a human hubris to think that we know and to know so well that we know what's good for good everyone. everyone. Good for yeah. everyone, precisely. And, and, and we were confident that the ripple effects of us oppressing people um, is worth it. And I, I strongly would suspect that it's not worth it. I think it's much better for people to self-regulate themselves and be like, this person's opinions are stupid uh, versus um, let's check the rule book of the things that we're allowed to say and not say. Mm. I can see that kind of like frozen rigidity um, also shows up like the kind of people that are selected for and self-selecting to get into political power are not operating under the paradigm of let's hold as much uncertainty as we can because it's really not advantageous for them to do that um no they put they put up a front their whole lives that they under like you like you said uh, earlier this hyper con hyper high conviction my policy is the best policy and my yeah. team is the best my opponent is the worst even though it's on my same party and then like the other side is the worst party uh, and candidate if if i'm in the general election like there's nothing that there's few things that get you more mm, detached from the truth than being than you you kind of growing up in politics and uh, being trying to trying to win favor of the masses um, throughout your life right like all you know is just like hmm, what did the polling data say and you just you never develop a soul you're just a whore for whatever is like hot at a time and that's that's just not the kind of person that you want to be okay. leading yeah. your country yeah okay i think i'm starting to understand this now um because what you're speaking to, like I think of Joe Biden, especially, you know, yeah, geriatric, geriatric Joe Biden is the epitome of that. That circumstance in which you're living through the mask and who you actually are underneath um, is has been so hollowed out by decades and decades and decades of participating in the mask that and, and now the, the coherency of the mask itself begins to break down with his old age um and i think that's i think i understand that's what you're getting at with the the horrification of america is effectively something like giving primacy to the mask that gets you somewhere or gets you what you want over what feels true yeah i mean i i don't I don't respect or believe anything that Joe Biden says. Nothing. I believe that it's uh, he's always saying, "Oh, well, I shouldn't have said that." And when like randomly he's actually authentic, and who knows how authentic he's like, "Oh, my handlers are going to be upset about. They're gonna they're gonna get mad at me for that." Like who's getting who's getting mad for you? The fucking president. Who's gonna get mad at you for that? For 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 you speaking your mind. But that's that's the entire like mo of his whole like campaign and team it's it's like the super fragile entity that like is barely clinging on to power because um it was never i don't know he he's like he is so it feels like he has so little power he's like he's like a prisoner to his party <laughs> Um, I would need to think about why that's not true for RFK. I think part of why I feel is less true for RFK is because I feel like if RFK loses, he's still going to be a sovereign individual <laughs> that like is still going to speak truth regardless of whether he's the president or not. That's that's what it feels like to me. And mm -hmm. with Joe Biden, it just feels like 
his entire goal is not to speak truth or to make a, a particular positive difference, just to hang on <laughs> and like make it day by day, uh, in part because he's old, but in part because he really, he, you know, I don't know how much he would admit it. He's a puppet. He's really just a puppet that is need to say certain lines, sign certain documents. Um, what does it say about our country that that's our leader, that we have a, like a, you know, a, a, a truly mindless, I don't want to say whore, like, but he, like, he just he embodies like a soullessness of, of America. There's Joe Biden's and all of corporate America, right? That have literally sold out their soul to rise to the top, you know, fuck over the coworkers, like play the game of politics in the workplace. And uh, that's, I think many of these uh, institutions that may have a certain market cap may crumble in the next few years. Um, and a lot of the people that thought that they would get away with having no soul are not going to get away with it um, at, the, at the end of the day. Um, mm. And it's like, even though I have such a strong conviction of that, um, it is still hard to do what feels right uh, because the real silent majority has not, I think I'm going to encounter more and more people that are part of like the real virtue, like a virtuous silent, I don't want to say majority, it's group that will grow over time. That's like tired of people putting um, virtue and the truth last, using it as like a, a tool versus like an end in itself um but um i and we can there's a lot to talk about with everything i said but i i think that we are going to shift in the coming years to it being a real competitive advantage um to have chosen a hard path that prioritizes virtue over short-term power and profit and saying whatever it, it, to do, get ahead. Because I think we, we've just maxed out on bullshit. And the thing about bullshit leaders and organizations is that they don't actually provide value to um, society. Um, sort of in, in the way that a, a legitimate organization built for the highest good can and will so i'm i guess i'm looking forward to all these different bubbles that all have a common thread kind of bursting which is going to be very uh, messy but in the chaos and decay is like a huge opportunity for new networks of support uh, of artists and entrepreneurs and investors etc that aren't full of shit uh, to quickly build stuff that is actually really useful for humanity yeah you and me both you and me both i think what i what i heard in that last thread is that we are in a confrontation with the content of our souls um, in this time. And that in some ways is like the deepest reality of all of the levels of instability and polarization and all of the different symptomatic instantiations of that, whether it's addiction or violence or what have you. Um, Ultimately, there is like a root uh, confrontation with the soul that's occurring. And what you spoke to of the competitive advantage, I mean, your durability, your resilience, right? That's what we talked about last summer. Um, that's the deepest form of resilience. That's the resilience that maintains people under the harshest conditions. Um, 
And I think it's the only path that will afford a redemptive spirit to rise in America. And that is something that maybe RFK, the thing about RFK is that he's not like Superman at all. No. <laughs> but it's like, there's this clear sense that a, a greater spirit animating the people can move through him and around him. And within that can be, um, can be that redemptive property as well, which looks to those people who are corrupted, you know, with um, compassionate confrontation. And truth is confrontative. And so, so there's this whole idea of soul force, soul power. You know, that's really what I think about when I think about MLK. Is like, he's allowing the currents of truth to flow through him. Um, and that's what's giving power to his voice. It's not just his skillful manipulation or presentation of himself to achieve that so yeah i deeply resonate with that and uh i guess the question mark for me is what what can i do or how can i be to afford the reality that rfk represents and I don't know that that actually means, I mean, I did donate to his campaign, but I'm not actually sure that the way this is played is how we usually think about playing it and whether it's fundamentally yeah. like, Oh, I need to like go to America and knock on a bunch of doors or, you know, just circulate a bunch of stuff. You know, that's how we've kind of done political campaigning and you've probably oh, yeah. done a lot more than me. It's, it's funny. Cause that, that way of doing political campaigning has always felt so weird and like, this is, this is also just like a pattern in, in, in like society today. It's like this thing that never made sense or barely makes any sense and it's super inefficient that it's done because it's, it was done before. And then there's also an industry around it. Oh, it's like, maybe we don't do it anymore. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And we do something that's like way more hitting at like first principles. What is what should a camp it should inspire people? I remember when Joe was not in a front runner uh, in in like 2019, let's say, and I was just like, I I've never met a Joe Biden supporter, like a fan, and it, and really what RFK can do is generate real fans um, that are that are that can that are willing to think critically about okay what assets and <clears throat> digital physical money or non-monetary um, can i contribute to this movement and you know, i have a couple people that apparently are close to the team but so we'll see if, if there's any opportunity to work work with the team at all but um i think we might already be on the team yeah absolutely i mean i think the the, the very authentic decentralized nature of it is, is is really solid i think what i would do if if i was able to like contribute is create like official like guides on how to like okay you're you're interested in this campaign here's read this hey okay. here's how to best contribute so whatever we think of on the best way to contribute to the campaign um we can just do, develop a collective intelligence of like mm. things that people can do but um i think i i got a lot of i got a lot of like i got some negative messages but a lot of really positive messages from my my tweet thread about rfk Like a lot of people that were like, oh, I can't pub publicly agree with this. Okay, first of all, that's annoying. But 
it's like thank you for saying that it's like lots of lots of kudos to you <laughs> and it, it is like these like i like, think like part of why it felt nerve-wracking for me to post it was because i am someone that a lot of people do wonder what i think and look up to is like a i don't know it's just it's a little bit too binary to me but like a lot of people do follow what i'm thinking and 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 the logic be behind me not sharing that is oh will they respect me less or uh or giving taking seriously a conspiracy theorist and by the way what better way to try to kneecap rfk than say that he is the campaign of untruth when the whole point is that he is the campaign of truth what a better what a brilliant fucking move that's exactly what's happening and again, I'm not defending every single factoid that he's ever uttered. I'm not defending that. I'm defending the big truths he has gotten right. And I'm not saying that Fauci has never uttered a truth, but the biggest truths, he's a big ass fucking liar. And so, um, where am I going with this? Well, I guess me posting this, like, because I'm like a node a meaningful node, an influential node within like a network of a lot of people, mm -hmm. me just saying, it's not that scary to, to just take, take this person seriously. Who knows what the ripple effects of that are, right? So imagine just like anyone that actually feels like they have respect, like intellectual credibility, within a community or spiritual credibility really like honestly like that's as much as anything like i like i don't think i don't think people would it, it'll immediately come to them but like a lot of people like me because of my vibes because they think that i have a good pulse on what is good right like mm -hmm. that i don't associate myself with scam projects right and so again the 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 fear is that if people misunderstand what i mean when I take RFK seriously, that um, they think I'm not, I'm not seen clearly when I feel like I'm, I've never seen more clearly. <laughs> right? That's like, well, that's like the soup. It's like the super, it's like, it's like, ah, it's like a lot of emotions. It's like, uh, like, I, and I know that I would have felt way worse by not posting it because I had the idea to post it. And if I didn't post it, I'd be like, wow, I'm, if I, if I can't have a little bit of courage, who can have courage? Because I think about that. I think about the censorship culture and machine that has been created. So if I'm already thinking about that uh, and I'm not willing to take the minor risk and I've never been more free because I'm not part of a nonprofit where the board members are worried about their image and blah, 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 blah. No. I'm not part of that anymore. I'm a lot free. I'm technically, well... I'm a lot freer than I used to be. And so if it's really just, if I have fewer excuses than I've ever had, and I'm still a coward, like we have no, like, wh wh why would I expect anyone else to not be a coward? Yeah. Yeah, I commend you for that. And I, I also went through a very similar process with my most recent sub stack where I was posing tough questions about LGBT pride movement and progressivism. Mm -hmm. And I could feel that censoriousness of like who amongst the people who I'd love to connect with are going to write me off because of culture war and prisms and so on. Um, but I'm one of the very few people who has the economic freedom because my employer doesn't give a fuck mm. about what I do creatively that mm. I actually have a responsibility because I yeah. know for a fact that all of my yeah, friends do, with yeah. those kinds of jobs um, wouldn't dare and they've been trained not to for years they've been trained since college and they've been trained by the companies they worked for to not and so yeah 
soulful I courage. That. I think I'm gonna journal about that, about the responsibility piece. It's powerful. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and I think this is probably a good place to draw a circle around our meandering today. Um, yeah, really good to uh, feel the temperature of the waters with you. And yeah, some very alive currents. And I also really appreciate how I feel able to articulate myself quite well in your listening as well. Like mm, I really feel yeah. I'm able to come forward. Uh, and that's that's a great gift that we can afford one another as well as to, to really just give space to be able to come fully forward um, and part of the return home and to family and so on is to like re-enter all those spaces where you are compressed and to like find the courage in there to uh, to be all that you are and that is ultimately in service of the whole. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Speaking of service, the next conversation we should talk a bit about Christ because there's a lot of interesting trends in society happening, also personally for me as well. So, but a lot, a lot more will have happened by the next time we chat. It's kind of all very emergent for me right now. I'd love to, and uh, yeah very alive for me right now and say it's almost at the core of my life project so we can definitely talk about that thanks jacob thanks for the time and the the space and the the, the really helpful dialogue thank you gary until next time